Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Welcome to our first panel session for the National Integrity Summit 2021. Uh, this is a panel on ending impunity um, within the topic of ending impunity and the panel subject is on prosecuting corruption. I'd like to thank uh, everyone that's in the room attending the summit physically. We acknowledge the presence of a number of agencies within the sector that participate also in the National Integrity Systems Assessment, which was launched earlier this morning uh, by the Prime Minister, the Deputy Head of the EU Delegation, and the Chairman of TIPNG. Uh, my name is Yuan Bari Haiwe. I'm the Deputy Director for Partnerships and Policy with TIPNG, and I will be the moderator for this session. Um, prior to starting, I just wanted to go through some house rules in terms of how I'll be conducting this session. Um, because of COVID-19 measures, obviously, we'll be uh, maintaining social distancing on stage and keeping our masks on. Um, we also have social distancing within the room. Um, this means that in terms of conducting this session, we'll also have a limited question and answer session. And what we're doing for those that are in the room and those that are also joining us on the Zoom link is that we'll be receiving questions via Zoom. Um, so if you have questions, please type them into the chat uh, box in Zoom. And for those of you that are in the room, if you have any questions from any of the discussion points that you'd like us to address towards the end, please write them down on a note and pass them to my colleague at the desk in the corner so that they can send through the messages to me. Uh, sorry, the desk in the corner and hand going up. So please pass there any comments or questions that you'd like for any of the panelists. Uh, this is to ensure that we have uh, minimal contact of mics going back and forth. And we're also on Zoom, so I'm very mindful of the time delay that we want to make sure that we get as much content from this session as possible. Um, this panel session is looking at prosecuting corruption. There is a perception that there is much impunity in Papua New Guinea. Um, multiple um, experts, multiple agencies, multiple practitioners have observed that we have strong legal system, we have laws that are adequate, but then when it comes to actually prosecuting those that are responsible, we fall short. So this panel session is looking at that. What are the challenges that we face in prosecuting corruption in PNG? Um, I'd like to introduce the distinguished panelists that we have on stage with us. Um, firstly, to my left, to your right, I have Mr. Matthew Damaro. If we could give him a round of applause for joining us on stage. Uh, to introduce Mr. Damaro to those of you in the room, I think you're all aware of Mr. Damaro's work. Uh, for those of you joining online uh, and maybe abroad and might not have encountered, encountered Mr. Damaro, He's with the National Fraud and Anti-Corruption Directed within the Royal Papua New Guinea Constabulary, which is the police force of PNG. Uh, when people think of anti-corruption fighters in PNG, they think of people like Mr. Damaro. So he's a seasoned expert with over 30 years of experience within law enforcement, and he's also the director of the National Anti-Fraud and Corruption Directorate. 
Uh, our second panelist is Mrs. Josephine Pitmore. If you could have a round of applause for her as well. Uh, Ms. Pitman is with the Department of Justice and Attorney General in Papua New Guinea. Um, she was with the Legal and Executive Branch for a number of years and is currently Deputy Secretary. She also sits on the Committee for the National Anti-Corruption Strategy Task Force and has done a lot of the work that goes towards coordinating anti-corruption in PNG. Uh, on the far left of me, far right for you, we have Mr. Jerome Sesega. Uh, if you could give him a round of applause as well. Uh, Jerome is a director on the TIPNG board. He's also a legal practitioner, uh, practicing lawyer, and he's joining us uh, on the panel. Uh, for those of you that joined on Zoom and some of you in the room, you would have seen in the initial program that we sent out that we had the Office of the Public Prosecutor also joining us on this panel. We've had an adjustment in that because they have uh, an issue that is currently before the court, so the delegate that was supposed to attend this session has obviously had to go to court and um, conduct her duties. So we, we acknowledge the support of the Office of the Public Prosecutor, but unfortunately they are unable to join us uh, this morning. Um, the nature of this discussion will really be not so much a presentation, but we want to get to that topic of how do we effectively prosecute corruption in PNG. And we'll be drawing from the experts that we have on the panel and the discussions that they have. Uh, I'd like to start with Mr. Damaru. Uh, Mr. Damaru, there's been a lot of public perception that anti-corruption anti efforts have been minimal and that corruption is rife in the country. Um, and often people turn to your office, the National Fraud and Anti-Corruption Directorate, as one of the key actors that you know, continuously tries to take action against corruption in PNG. But there is often a lack of understanding of the role of your entity, the work that it does, how it works within the police, and maybe the mandate of the directorate. So maybe as an opening uh, prompt, if you could uh, explain to the audience and to those viewing online, what is the, the role and the function of the National Fraud and Anti-Corruption Directorate uh, and its current uh, objectives in Papua New Guinea? Thank you. Thank you. Um, the National Fraud and Anti-Corruption Directorate is a, uh, a directorate within the Criminal Investigation uh, Division of the Royal Papua New Constabulary. And uh, NFSACD, uh, for short, uh, uh, is the mandated uh, directorate uh, that is tasked with uh, investigating fraud and corruption in the country. Uh, corruption uh, in the past uh, was very uh, minimal and uh, we dealt with uh, mainly the um, simple fraud, uh, false, uh, false pretense, various checks, uh, those uh, kind of uh, uh, offenses. Now corruption has gone uh, to the uh, highest level the, in terms of amount in Kina value and, uh, and the uh, complexity and uh, uh, the nature and uh, the method as to how it has been committed. And it makes the work of the National Fraud and Anti-Corruption Directorate very, very difficult uh, to deal with. Uh, when we have uh, uh, such a situation, uh, the director needs a lot of support to ensure that he does his, his job. At the uh, NFSA CD, uh, we, have a, uh, we have a process when the complaint is received. Uh, uh, it is properly uh, assessed, registered, assessed, given a... a uh, uh, crime, uh, uh, crime report number assessed, and uh, if it meets the criteria for 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 us to investigate, uh, we will investigate. Meaning, if it is uh, over 100,000 kina, and uh, it's involving high profile persons, and uh, it's uh, of national interest, it's involving uh, assets that needs to be uh, restrained. Consecrated, uh, those are some of the uh, criteria that we uh, use to, to identify the case that we uh, will investigate, the director will investigate. Those uh, cases that do not come within this uh, uh, criteria are referred to, uh, we have in the provinces, we have uh, provincial fraud units uh, who conduct investigations. And uh, if it's to do with the uh, leadership uh, issue, we, uh, the matter is referred to Ombudsman Commission. Uh, and, and also, uh, if it's to do with uh, tax to IRC, 
uh, we we don't keep uh, the, the files you know with us uh, only them on uh, pending. We have them refer to relevant uh, agencies to to deal with. Uh, but if we, if you see that there's there's no merit in the complaint, we ask the complainant that uh, the case does not have any merit. The matter, the matter is closed. I think, thank you for explaining the, the mandate and the initial stages of the investigation and also the criteria for the types of cases that the National Fraud and Anti-Corruption Directorate um, handles. And you, you mentioned that there's a monetary threshold of 100,000 kina and also that you have networks of partners that deal with certain uh, specific cases, like if it's below the threshold or if it's in the provinces of it's a leadership code violation. Um, I think one of the things that maybe viewers might want to also know is what is the actual process when someone comes in? Let's say you have someone in a, in a community somewhere that they think their uh, funds have been improperly abused by someone and they come to a police station and they want to report that matter. What are the kinds of documents or uh, evidence or processes that they need to engage with in order for that complaint to then reach your office for investigation? Is there any steps or processes that have to happen before that? Yes, uh, we, uh, with the uh, uh, public, uh, they can come into the uh, force good office and report. Uh, if they have a basic uh, 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 documents that they have, they have, uh, we can use that. Um, that will form a basis from, from which we can conduct our investigations. Based on those uh, uh, basic information, uh, in the director, we have what we call the uh, initial action team. It goes uh, out and get, uh, get, uh, obtains more, more detailed information uh, so that we can be able to assess, so that it meets our criteria to investigate that matter. And then once you've done the investigation and you have this file, and when it comes to taking action and taking it to the court to prosecute, is that something that still resides within your office or do you then depend on external partners? Once, we, once the matter is assessed and it meets our criteria, we go into investigations. Uh, 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 cases are assigned to a, uh, a detective to conduct investigations. Uh, there's uh, issues that we, uh, uh, we take into consideration when we are uh, investigating. Uh, in the re uh, recent past, we have seen um, uh, policemen, uh, not only in Fort Squad, uh, in other uh, units as well, uh, who tend to investigate uh, people instead of crime. And most of our problems uh, uh, in recent cases has been uh, this, that uh, police have been investigating crime. Uh, uh, people, they uh, uh, pick up somebody, uh, they name him, this the suspect, uh, go after him. So uh, in the process, they get all the evidence uh, uh, and try to uh, find ways to, uh, to prosecute, and it does not water. And that's how we have lost a lot of cases. So in, in the first court, uh, uh, the policy is, is that uh, we do not investigate uh, people. We investigate crime. In the process, the crime will lead, make connection to those who are involved in the commis commission of that crime. Uh, to the, uh, throughout the investigations, we keep to the uh, b uh, basic principles of investigations. We conduct investigations according to the rules of law. So that uh, whatever uh, evidence we, we collect, we gather in the process of investigations, uh, will, be, will be admitted uh, in court. And the end result will be the successful prosecutions. And this prosecution is done by directorate offices or in partnership? We make the arrest and uh, uh, the, the case goes to the uh, committal uh, court process. Committal mm -hmm. court process is basically um, a screening process to establish uh, that the, the case as a prima facie case, mm -hmm. so that it can be referred to the national court for, uh, for uh, to, to public prosecutor and to the national court uh, for prosecutions. That's where the trial is uh, conducted. Uh, but at the uh, criminal uh, uh, at the uh, district court. The district court uh, magistrate does not have the power to, uh, to dismiss the case. It can only uh, withdraw or strike out information. And, uh, uh, and if the case is struck out at the uh, uh, committal court, we have the option to f uh, further pursue the case to, uh, 
to uh, ex officio indictment to the office of the public prosecutor. Uh, if he thinks that there's, uh, there's sufficient evidence, he will commit the person to stand trial in the national court. Thank you. And I think uh, at that stage I'll come to Jerome, yeah. um, because this is really uh, key constitutional provisions that we have on integrity um, that we speak of in, at this summit. Uh, when we talk of integrity, it also means independence between processes. And I think the importance of the independence between the investigating body and the, the prosecutory body. So maybe, Jerome, you could just speak to that. Why, why do we have in the Constitution this separation of uh, the investigatory process and the prosecution process? And what is the, 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 the good governance principles that are embedded in that? Thanks, Jiwa. Um, thank you, Mr. Tamar. There was a great explanation just you know, setting the platform. And basically, there's this quote that I like. It's about good governance, excuse me. It says, we cannot be mere consumers of good governance. We, we must be participants. You know, we must be co-creators. And basically, that speaks towards the fact that we all have a role to play um, with establishing good governance, especially in this space of um, prosecuting corruption matters. But um, it's also important to establish that um, one person cannot play that role. Not, not only one party. It needs to be um, a shared role. Um, between not only a, in, um, the investigative body, which is the police, the fraud squad, but also the prosecuting body, um, public prosecutor. I think it's important to actually have um, a line in the sand, so to speak, some impartiality, because you can't have the, the same person who goes out and collects the evidence, is face-to-face -face with the accused, talks to the witnesses, you know, that, that same person um, cannot come and then go to court and, and prosecute that matter. Um, if you look at it, just like logically speaking, there's already some conflict of interest, already issues that are already popping up from that. There's issues with regards to um, collusion or some temptations that affects that whole process, that taints that process. I think that's important because when you look back at how the Constitution is um, enabled in terms of the separation of powers, that speaks towards how you know, the judicial is separate to the, the executive, that's separate to the legislature. And that, that sort of, it waters down back to how we, we proceed with these sort of matters at that lower stage, at the stage of you know, getting an indictable offense. I know um, Mr. Dummer was speaking with regards to the committal court. If I can, I know the, the public prosecutor is in here to speak specific to their roles. Maybe if I can give a general um, understanding uh, just f for those lay, lay people that don't really understand that process. Basically what happens is the police to do um, an indictable offense and they charge someone with an indictable offense. Um, that's basically an offense that has penalties that ranges um, under 12, year, um, 12 months, pardon me, one year. So uh, let's say, the, the, the charge of official corruption is located under Section 87 of the Criminal Code. That's, not, that's, that's an indictable offense in the sense that it has penalties of, let's say, seven years. So what would happen is that the, the police would charge with that offense. They bring it to the committal court, how Mr. Dummer was speaking to, and then the magistrate decides as to whether or not it's a prima, prima facie case in that whether or not it's, it's got that evidence, the evidence is sufficient for it to be proceeded to to trial in the national court. And that's where the public prosecutor comes into play. So the public prosecutor comes out and then they decide, oh, should we lay a charge? Should we not lay a charge? Um, and then they prosecute that matter. But, but speaking back to how everyone has a part to play, the, the police and the fraud squad have a re really important part to play in terms of you know, garnering the evidence. And then the public prosecutor has, a, has another important part to play in terms of prosecuting and utilizing that evidence to bring to trial, and then you have the judiciary who has a part to play in terms of you know, hearing the matter, and then based on the merits of their case, making a decision. So it's, it's, the crux of it is everybody has a part to play, and as long as you play your part to the best of your abilities and put the evidence before the court, you should be able to get a good decision. Yeah, and thank you for um, explaining those key proce procedural um, components of corruption prosecution. Uh, just going back on what you said about the independence between these constitutional officers, um, this independence is important, so like you said, to ensure that there's a carriage of justice, make sure that um, decisions are made in a fair manner and that you don't have uh, collusion or conflicts of interest, as you mentioned. But with that independence, there also comes maybe a certain um, requirement for transparency so that those powers are not abused or, you know, if we have discretion that's completely within one office holder, they have to be accountable for the decisions they take or not, you know, pursue. So 
what are the expected like levels of transparency if you have office holders that are investigating or that are prosecuting or that make decisions as in the judiciary as you mentioned what's the type of information that citizens should expect to get from each stage of this so that they are aware that uh, a process is being undertaken is it uh, statistics is it an update on a matter if it doesn't you know proceed if it's un unsuccessful what kind of information should citizens you know you know want want to know about this uh, independent processes that are occurring. Well, that's, that's a good point you make there with regards to transparency. Um, I think with any public office, any public office holder, um, you come with a level of um, expected transparency in what you do. Um, in, in, in the legal fraternity, we have this saying where, you know, justice done is, um, justice needs to be seen as well, to be, to be done. So I guess the people that are most affected need to see justice being done. And that, that plays into how, you know, it's, how the matter is investigated, you know, you know the, the complainant seeing the police go out and, and um, make the, the witness statements, you know, take the, taking people to um, the police station, interviewing them, that's justice being done, being seen to be done, that's transparency happening, right, in that, in that space. Um, as, as soon as it goes to the point of the criminal court and the public prosecutor actually moving forward with that, prosecuting based on the evidence and ensuring that the evidence is, is in place and ensuring that the matter is indeed actually prosecuted. You know, that, that's one thing as well. And you see in court and you go to criminal court and you see it actually happening, that's transparency happening in, in, the, in, the, in the courthouse. And I guess actions do speak louder than words. And if you, are, if you want to see transparency, you need to show transparency. And that, that's, at the end of the day, I think our people, most of our people are, are like illiterate. They don't understand that on the legal, like 75% of our subsistence farmers. So they don't understand this, the legal, technical, you know, framework, the legal jargon. But as soon as they can see something happening, they make a complaint and they can see an arrest being made or they can see um, something in the courthouse or they see, or oh, this matter is being listed or this um, person has been arrested or the fraud squad's gone out and done this. I think that that in itself is what transparency is. And we need to see more of that. I think that's, at the end of the day, we need to see more of that happening. And I'm sure Mr. Tomorrow can speak to more. Yep. And I think um, at this stage, I'd like to maybe bring in Mrs. Pitmo, um, because we're talking about this transparency and disclosure of uh, some of these processes. And it's important to also collect statistics and to know, you know what are the levels of successful prosecutions or maybe the current um, state of uh, justice in the country. So maybe Ms. Pitmo, you can speak to uh, what the department sees as like the key indicators that you're looking at to see whether there is effective access to justice and success within that uh, law enforcement and justice sector. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so we learned this morning from the presentation by um, TIPNG on the National Assessment Integrity Systems that uh, there's a big um, gap in terms of law uh, on, on the top level as the, as the threshold. And in practice, um, there's, there's a big gap, uh, gap in between. So it seems that the law is, is one thing, but on the other hand, in terms of enforcement is another. So um, this morning, I'll probably I'll just speak um, in the context of ICAC as one of um, the solutions or one of the um, offers on the table to, um, to address some of the challenges that we currently face mainly in the practice uh, aspects of things. Um, so you would note that recently ICAC was passed and one of the main, uh, the main purpose of ICAC really is to, is to contribute to cooperating with agencies. So the key term here is cooperation. Uh, and I think that's one of the main reasons why we have so many challenges in, in enforcement in terms of practice. Um, so cooperation, mainly to deal with uh, three functions. So with ICAC, there's, there's three functional areas. You would have um, investigation on one end, uh, prevention on one hand, and then you have uh, prosecution. So when you see these three, three functional areas, you would note that um, uh, investigation and prosecution, really, they are, they are more offense-based. So you would, you would go and, uh, or investigate or prosecute uh, methods of conduct that have already occurred. 
But in terms of prevention, this is something that uh, has not been done. It's, 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 it's something that is futuristic, it's something that uh, long-term, and it's something to do with the mind. So that's, that's the um, main crust of ICAC. And for, for, for as a solution to one of the, um, or solution to the issues that are affecting the country, cooperation is key. And in terms of um, the corruption itself, ICAC does not define the uh, corruption. It actually leaves it open, and there's a reason why. And you could, uh, you could uh, infer or uh, come up with your own assessment why it was left open. Uh, the, the intention was really to just limit it to uh, purely corrupt conduct based. And corrupt conduct based, if you see the definition, it has three categories of offenses. And one of them, first is the criminal offenses. And then you would have the uh, misconduct in office offenses or the category. And then the third category would be administrative offenses. And that's, if, you see the, uh, if you see it in that way, you would see that really it's not one agency responsible. Uh, where criminal offenses comes in, that, that first, first category, you would obviously see public prosecutor's office uh, and police involved. And then where misconduct in office comes in, you would see ombudsman commission is involved. Because those are offenses that involve a certain position or a certain authority or certain trust in people who have been entrusted of stewardship responsibilities. And then the third category is really the administrative offenses. And that goes to every agency. And you would see in the public service, the public service has what we call the general orders that speaks about certain conduct that is expected of public servants. But in terms of practice, you would see that you have uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the code of conduct that you, you, you're supposed to come to work at 7.45 and leave work at uh, 4.06 or don't chew boy at the workplaces. But in terms of practice, that is not uh, what really is happening. And that, you can categorize it as administrative offenses. So really, it goes back to agencies. Agencies are responsible to put up their code of conduct or strengthen the uh, respective code of conduct in their offices so that those type of administrative offenses can be minimized. Uh, and it does not lead to those two other categories of offenses, which is misconduct in offices, as well as the, and the bigger one, which is ending up committing a crime uh, at the end of the day. So um, for, for us in the Justice Administration, we see that um, strengthening cooperation and understanding roles of each of the agencies is very crucial. Uh, we need to uh, cooperate and the main reason why ICAC is established is to facilitate that cooperation, to ensure, and of course some people argue that it's a duplication of, of functions, but for me, it's not a duplication of functions. Really, it's to strengthen that cooperation so we could see um, what we, we now, so many people see that there's a lot of impunity happening, and it's because of lack of um, cooperation. And we, when we strengthen that cooperation and understanding each of each other's roles and responsibilities. And the definition in corrupt conduct actually already sets out at um, the level or category of offenses where we all come in. For us in the, in the and like for us integrity offices, you might come in in the area of uh, prevention, uh, education, uh, or in the, in the prosecution investigation part of it. Of course, I get some people argue that it, it um, uh, it, it will sort of also uh, have more like a one-stop shop, but really that's only for um, indictable offenses, but the other offenses are still there in the criminal court, and rightfully those are offenses that are prosecuted or will be prosecuted and uh, will continue to be prosecuted by uh, the police, um, police force or police department. Um, so those are basically, I think, the main takeaway uh, for... For, for this one is, is really on cooperation. Uh, we have to take a, um, more emphasis on cooperation and understanding each role and also respecting each other's um, uh, boundaries or jurisdictions and leaving certain things to where they, they, they're supposed to be or to agencies. 
and it's just pointing out, out that we are there to help uh, and we, we are there to support because corruption really uh, is everyone's business. It's not just one agency, it's everyone uh, in the country, whether you're playing your part in terms of minimizing the administrative offenses that are occurring that con continue to, um, uh, once not properly and addressed, leads to you know, misconduct in office or even criminal offenses. So thank you. Thank you for, thank you for speaking to that, uh, Ms. Kim. Uh, I think uh, there are a number of interesting points that are raised there, particularly on um, the tension that exists between the independence of um, constitutional offices, but also the cooperation that needs to exist for successful prosecution uh, to obtain in Papua New Guinea. Um, I think I, I want to go to Mr. Damaru and, and just ask for um, the, the point around Sorry, I just wanted to um, reflect on the points that were raised by Mrs. Pitmo and um, the, the tension that exists maybe, not tension, but the balancing act that is required for uh, maintaining independence between uh, or amongst constitutional office holders, but also that cooperation that's um, required for effective prosecution. So there has to be that cooperation, but we also have to respect that independence that exists. I wanted to come to Mr. Damaru on that point because uh, you mentioned in your opening remarks how uh, the National Fraud and Anti-Corruption Directorate in PNG uh, does cooperate with the Ombudsman Commission and does co cooperate with provincial fraud officers. And maybe you can explain how does that cooperation exist? Is it in the form of a formal arrangement like a MOU? Is there some kind of uh, arrangement or agreement or is there some framework? Or is it more of an understanding that exists between the heads of agencies? How does that cooperation come about? How is it maintained? And how do we ensure that you know, it's, it's effectively there? And we also had a, a question from one of the Zoom pa um, participants uh, just asking about the differences between the Ombudsman Commission and the National Fraud and Anti-Corruption Directorate. So those differences do exist. So how do you come to that agreement, that cooperation, so that you can transfer cases over? How is that done? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, maybe uh, take a step further from uh, uh, cooperation uh, to uh, coordination. Uh, the corruption is going. The corruption is really going into all our systems. The corruption is going into all our systems. This is technical difficulties with the phones here. Yeah? Yeah, what, what, what I said was that. Uh, uh, on top of having a, a cooperation uh, amongst the agencies, uh, I'd like to take a step further uh, that there needs to be a coordination if you, if you have to uh, minimize or if you have to uh, have some success in fighting corruption. Uh, the agencies can uh, try to fight corruption on their own, using their own uh, legislative powers, uh, but if there is no uh, cooperation, if there's no coordination, uh, we'll be uh, uh, not succeeding in, uh, in our efforts in fighting corruption. We, the difference between the Ombudsman Commission and uh, the police is that uh, police will deal with the uh, uh, criminal matters, criminal investigations, uh, where there is uh, a leader involved when we re uh, receive a complaint and a leader is involved we do the uh, in investigation into the criminal conduct and we refer the same file to the Ombudsman Commission so that they can do investigations on the reader under the leadership code. So uh, if the reader is found, uh, found guilty, um, uh, 
on criminal charges, he can go to jail. Uh, and that does not stop. Or if he goes to jail, then uh, that does not stop the uh, Ombudsman Commission because uh, Ombudsman Commission conduct the investigations. And uh, if he, if he comes, comes out of uh, prison, if he holds another uh, leadership position, he will be still be dealt with for, for his uh, uh, misconduct. So that's the uh, that's a, that's a difference. But we have a very good uh, working relationship. Uh, we say information if they receive a complaint and it involves uh, uh, a leader, and there's elements of uh, uh, criminal uh, uh, criminal offences been committed. The Ombudsman Commission refers the matters uh, to the fraud squad so that we can conduct criminal investigations. In the, in the past, some years, some years ago, we had uh, a, a, uh, uh, a organization or entity uh, called uh, National Anti-Corruption Alliance, NACA. We had, we had uh, agencies, about uh, eight, nine agencies that came together to conduct investigations as a team, as a multi-skill, multi-agency uh, team to in investigate uh, a serious uh, fraud, corruption. And what we found out from there was that uh, because there was a coordination, we were able to uh, coordinate, put our resources together, and take prompt uh, actions. And uh, we saw a timely uh, con conclusion of the investigations, uh, prosecutions, and many people went to jail. And uh, what, what happened was the uh, officers came from different, different agencies. They were in the, in the task force, but they would use their own legislative powers to conduct the investigations. The police were normally, were always the, uh, the lead agencies, because at the end of the day, arrests would have to be made, and that, would be the, that is the task of the police to arrest and uh, uh, bring the offenders to court. For some reasons, that was hijacked, and here we are. Uh, we are not we are not making headway in, in fight against the corruption because there's no coordination. After that, uh, uh, agency or that entity was uh, the process was uh, hijacked. We have, we have gone back to what we used to be. Agencies did their own investigations, and uh, you, can, you can imagine the time it takes. They conduct the investigations after the investigation, then they made, uh, refer the matter to the police. But when uh, uh, through the NACA uh, investigations, everybody's uh, in the team, and uh, it's, it's a timely investigations. And we saw results. We saw a lot of people go to jail. And uh, in the past, we, uh, uh, Fraud Squad used to make a lot of noise in the media. Not now. Not now we have, we, now we have gone, gone really, really, uh, really silent because a lot of things affect uh, our, our functions. And uh, uh, Prime Minister this morning mentioned about, you know, we've got a very good laws and I think it depends. Uh, uh, the implementation part is, is lacking. Uh, I agree with him. Papua New Guinea is overloaded with plenty of laws. But implementation, uh, it's almost uh, nil. Uh, very minimal and very minimal uh, impact. And uh, so I think we, uh, what, what I'm uh, uh, trying to say here is that I think there has to be a more coordinated effort in the fight against corruption and cooperation. Okay. Uh, people uh, want to want to uh, uh, protect their own uh, jurisdictions or their powers, but we, we have a common goal. We have a common enemy, and that is the corruption. Let's fight corruption as a team. I, we can make a difference. Uh, currently, uh, Fraud Squad is not making any any uh, headlines in the newspapers because we are basically staffed of resources, funding, and uh, there's no support 
we have basically uh, we have been rendered to be ineffective. I don't know what the motivation is, but while that is happening, the corruption is going high. So I think the challenge to uh, to everybody, uh, all the agencies, stakeholders, uh, let's work together, and uh, uh, together we can we can make a difference. Maybe I'll stop here. Yeah, maybe uh, yeah. For, for now. I'm really grateful, Mr. Damaro, for that like uh, terrific insight into the challenges that exist and also a bit of the history of the work that was done by the National Anti-Corruption Alliance. Um, I'm also aware very much so that there's a lot of the bodies in this room that deal with cases that are within that threshold of 100,000 and maybe they do have internal investigations or internal audit divisions that detect these issues. Some of them might be specialized bodies like the Financial Analysis and Supervision Unit that you already have existing partnerships with. But if there are other agencies out there that want to join in that fight and understanding that you have maybe the lack of capacity at the moment, um, how, how do you want agencies to maybe approach you if they do have internal detection of fraud or anti-corruption that meets the criteria. Is there any um, steps or procedures that they can take to make it easier for you when they hand over files or hand over investigations? Would, uh, they, they can uh, refer the matters to us, but we would, uh, would uh, want them to uh, uh, have the uh, case properly uh, uh, documented so that it makes, makes it easy for us uh, the uh, uh, Auditor General Service Finance Inspections uh, branch and um, uh, some uh, government agencies, uh, they do have internal audits. And uh, we appreciate their, their efforts. Uh, uh, most of the auditors uh, work very closely with us. Uh, uh, fraud investigators are not accountants, so we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, uh, interpret the uh, financial transactions uh, so the, the auditors do that for us. It makes the job uh, much e uh, easier for us. Uh, that's, the, that's one way we can uh, uh, work, uh, work together. And uh, uh, in, in, in the process, uh, try to assist uh, Fraud Squad to do what it is supposed to be doing. Uh, I mentioned, uh, like, just a while ago, Fraud Squad is, uh, currently has gone, gone very silent. Uh, uh, the, the, the challenge that we face every day is that uh, there is really no, uh, no funding to conduct any investigations. So you imagine 5,000 kina a month. That's, that, that's peanuts. What can you do? with 5,000 kina to conduct an investigation. Uh, annual budget is about uh, 360,000 kina. That's peanuts. And this is a big uh, drop from 1.2 million kina to, to, what, to, this, uh, to 360,000 kina. Uh, I, 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 for, for me personally, I, I, I see that the government has a, has a will to fight corruption. They are, they're talking about fighting corruption, they're doing something, passing laws. But when it comes to implementation, uh, we, we have nothing. You, you, you just look at the, uh, the figures. I'll give you an example. Uh, in 2020, uh, Foscode made about 20, uh, 26, uh, 36, 36 arrests. And uh, out of the 36, uh, about, about 13 uh, have been committed to stand trial. The balance is still uh, going to the committal process. If you had funding, the others, we would, we would have made about 100, 120 arrests. In fact, that's what we were, that, that's what we were uh, exhibiting in the past when we had uh, adequate funding. Now, 
there's lack of funding, so we, we, we can't make any. So most of the time, the, the, uh, we're just sitting around doing nothing in the office. There's no other security support. And uh, while we were sitting there, uh, uh, because there's lack of funding, uh, we also see there's a lot of uh, task forces you know, popping uh, uh, all over the place. And they have the money, they, they have been funded. And I wonder where the money is coming from to fund those uh, other task forces. We were doing four investigations, we were not four, four investigators. We were, we were not trained, and they are total liability. No productivity, no arrest, no convictions. And yet so much money spent on these task forces, on higher car. And I wonder where, where, the, where the funding is coming from. When the, when the director that has been mandated to investigate fraud and corruption is starved of all his resources. Uh, I think that's a, that's a question that uh, somebody will have to answer. It, it is really impact, uh, having a negative impact in the fight against corruption. If you stop doing what uh, you're supposed to be doing, uh, we've sold this uh, country to the dogs. Corruption is going to overwhelm us. Rest of you. And, and thank you, Mr. Damaro, for those statistics and also that assessment. Um, it's really uh, jarring to hear the, the struggles that your office faces in trying to address these issues. Um, also, a reminder to those watching on Zoom, please feel free to send through questions. If you're um, tweeting or posting on social media, please use the hashtag, hashtag PNG Integrity. Um, I think like it's important at this point to maybe look towards you, Jerome, um, and, and hearing this assessment from maybe the officer within the police that's responsible for that ending that level of impunity that we have in, in, in PNG. The civil society view on this, and you know, you see all these investigations that are happening. Is there a feeling of maybe um, people are now tired of so many investigations, and that when you hear an investigation coming out, is there an appetite for more than that? And if so, where should we be channeling that energy, um, given what Mr. Damaro has said? Thanks, you. Um, just want to applaud Mr. Damaro for his honesty and you know just really um, hitting nail on the head and talking about those you know serious issues that we need to talk about. I guess in terms of um, civil society, and I, I do wear my um, KPNG hat, um, we're, we're always there in, in, in the background, you know, just always questioning the governance of whatever that's happening. And it's always important to, to remember that we have always, every one of us, we've got to, we've got to be accountable for everything that we're doing. You know, even, that, even that's in our households, in where we're working. Um, and that, that same sentiment, you know, transfers to our leaders. You know, and for you know, Mr. Damaru uh, to have that sort of, you know, unfortunately, it's like quite a bleak outlook on you know that fight that we um, like we've been we've been doing this for a long time at TIPNG in terms of you know taking up that fight and standing in the background and you know asking those questions and for one of uh, the the stronger arms of you know associations um, entities like the Fraud Squad that we stand together with, um, it, it's it's quite unfortunate to see that. Um, uh, the sentiments that Mr. Damaru has shared. But I mean, saying that, you know, we will never um, be uh, backing down from this, you know, in, in terms of, you know, the, the, the fight's always gonna be there. We're, 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 not, we're not exhausted by it. In fact, um, I feel like, I know I'm sure uh, my chairman's um, doing that, you know, it, it's, it's garnering strength. You know, sometimes weakness does garner strength and, you know, you, you, as, as long as you identify, you know, what, what the issues are, Mr. Damaru refers to funding, you know, that's, that's something that can be an easy fix, you know? Like the government of today has, you know, advocated um, and are standing behind the, um, the idea of ICAC. And they, they, you can see that they are willing to uh, move in that direction. And if, if we were to organize or if the government was to look at funding for the fraud, fraud squad, for example, um, you know, that's, that's one fix, that's one box ticked. You know, that's one step forward. And I guess we just need to be able to uh, Ms. Pitmore is referring to collaboration, coming together. Mr. Dummer refers to collaboration, coordination, coming together, working as, as a group in instead of you know, one, one, one entity fighting on its own. So if we go on our resources, I feel like you know, this, this fight, you know, we, can t we, can, we can stand up and you know, continue the fight. And it's, it's, not a, it's not something that's gonna be you know, done deal, done and asked within one day. You know, it's, 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 it's something that our, our kids and their kids will also be faced with. And I guess it's important to just take those steps right now. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I think you also have another hat, which is that of uh, being a legal professional. And I think maybe the, 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 uh, the other component that we haven't stated in terms of capacity, it's not just funding, but also maybe having the best, the best minds, the brightest minds um, within the legal profession, um, maybe taking on this challenge and uh, committing to public service. And uh, what is the impression maybe from legal professionals in terms of this? Is this something within the legal fraternity that legal professionals are concerned about and are taking up the challenge of trying to uh, address uh, the level of impunity that we see? Um, is, is it that maybe the bad guys have better lawyers than the good guys? It's funny that you mentioned that because um, uh, I. I work in the private sector, so I do more, more, most of my work is in, in line with um, doing work in terms of um, defending those that have money, you know, and unfortunately, most of lawyers of this day, um, you go to law school and you um, have this, you know, noble, professional noble idea, it's all, all grandiose of, you know, going out there making money, making change, but I guess being able to understand what you can bring to the table and um, having that I guess the patriotism, I think that's lacking in a lot of young people today. Um, young law graduates, all of uh, my peers and also of uh, those that are following us in law school, I think we need to remember that uh, at the end of the day, you know, what can you do for your country? You know, and I guess for me as well, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge for myself because um, maybe I do need to go into the public sector. You know, maybe I need to go and um, do more work with you know, the public service. They, you know, don't, don't take it for granted. They do a lot of good work. Um, the public prosecutor, public solicitor, the state solicitor. It's just that sometimes, you know, they lack the resources and, and they, they lack the, the funding. They lack, you know, certain stuff that the private sector enjoys and that affects their work as well. So I think it's, again, it goes back to collaboration and being able to um, work, work, work on both sides. Thank you. Thank you for that insight and also for being candid in your response, Jerome. Um, I, I want to go back to Ms. Pitman because we've talked about cooperation and then coordination. And I know that um, within the Department of Justice and Attorney General, there are a number of um, peak body organization coordinating mechanisms that you have. Uh, you have the Law and Justice sec uh, Sector Secretariat. Um, you have Anti-Money Laundering, Counterterrorism Financing, uh, National Coordinating Committee. Uh, but you also have a National Anti-Corruption uh, Strategy Task Force. I just want uh, maybe for the audience, if we can maybe update them on what is the work of that body and um, what is the progress in terms of this national anti-corruption strategy that is supposed to allow us to be better able to coordinate our efforts. Um, and if we do have issues in capacity that we share resources, that we share talent, uh, maybe you can give us an update just on the national anti-corruption strategy and the task force. So uh, <clears throat> we currently have what is called the national uh, anti-corruption task force. So that particular um, administrative establishment was um, endorsed by NEC some years back, uh, and it comprised of all heads of um, departments. Um, over the years, they were meeting, and eventually, um, the, the the their meeting together sort of died. And for the first time this year, they came together again. So the work is starting. But at the technical level, we, we also have what is called the Anti-Corruption Technical Working Group. And this particular group has been um, working at the, uh, at the back, trying to um, work on all anti-corruption matters uh, in the country, especially in the public sector. So recently, they worked on what is called a National Anti-Corruption uh, Plan of Action. So this particular pl uh, plan of action is to, from 2020 to 2025. It basically provides 15 program of works for respective agencies that um, th these agencies actually met here and came, came up with their priorities that they wanna do in the next five years to implement the overall uh, national anti-corruption um, uh, strategy. So if you don't know that we have a national uh, anti-corruption strategy in place, we do have, and it's from 20, 20, 2010 to 2030, it's a 30-year strategy. Um, although that strategy is there, it provides the roadmap on what PNG wants to, to be like in, in, in 30 years' time. There was no implementation uh, mechanism for it. And the, uh, the plan of action is a way of trying to implement um, the overall or the generic framework, the policy guidelines that were set in that strategy. So this particular, what it, we, uh, it's short, we call it NECPA. Uh, actually now identifies 15 program of works for all those agencies that come under those three functional areas that I mentioned earlier on prevention, uh, 
investigation and prosecution. So there's a component for uh, prevention and that's more educational. And that's where education department comes in. And you would know that work in that area has actually started. Um, education department now has what is called a CCVE program. It's called Christian um, Citizenship Values Education. Before they call it, um, uh, it, it we know it by uh, religious instruction. Now it's no longer religious instruction. They actually will teach citizenship values um, because this is, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's being noted that uh, the previous education system that we had sort of teach theory and sort of teach people uh, go, to go and look for employment. But this one teaches people on how to create employment and also to live a, a life that they, uh, also be good citizens of what they can do for this country. So there's a really good program and it ties uh, perfectly well with the um, prevention mechanism that NECPA or the government had foreseen um, in, in uh, 10 years ago, in 2010. Uh, right now it has come into fruition, uh, fruition and, and they, uh, uh, last year, and this year they've actually uh, developed that curriculum which will be taught from grades one all the way to uh, 12. That's on the prevention side. For prosecution and investigation, um, there's still a lot to be done. Uh, we are also thankful that the European Union for, uh, in the next three years is, uh, has um, contrib or, or will contribute a certain or substantial amount of money to help the fight against corruption and to fund the NECPA, the National Anti-Corruption uh, Plan of Action. And that's where all the agencies will benefit from, those who have some elements of um, entry points that they can work towards eradicating corruption, whether it's in the administrative offenses, or whether it's prevention, or whether it's misconduct in offices, or whether it's criminal offenses, they will have to come together and work together and um, as a team, we can, we can uh, eradicate corruption in, in this country. Uh, before I leave, I also wanted to just make a point in relation to proceeds of crime. So here we talk about prosecuting crime and uh, you know, trying to prosecute all people who have benefited one way or another from a public purpose. Uh, but one of the, I think, uh, an area of improvement in, in the old system is actually um, the proceeds of crime. How do we then deal with those proceeds that have been um, unlawfully obtained through corrupt conduct or through corrupt means? I think from my own personal research, I've found that I think there was only one successful recovery of proceeds of crime. What happens to all those monies that were used over the years that are not used but obtained through illegal means? They were never returned to the public purse. Maybe someone can correct me, but from my own understanding, I was told there was only one case that actually had a successful recovery and where the money was written to the Consolidated Revenue Fund. We haven't talked about that area and it's something the agencies will need to sit down and look at so that there's, at the end of the table while we are gearing our efforts to trying to prosecute, prosecute, investigate, but what do we do with the, the money that have been benefited from? Do we just leave it like that and let those people go into jail and come out and they go back and benefit from those? Uh, whether it's material benefit or, you know, house or financial benefit, those have not been properly accounted for. And I think that's one big area of improvement that we also need to look at uh, in those respective agencies that are entrusted with that stewardship responsibility to look at those. Um, that's one. I think lastly, on the point that I made earlier on uh, corrupt, uh, sorry, code of conduct. So, um, uh, code of conduct, so one of the things I also noticed mainly in the public service, and I know in the private sector they have a lot of uh, systems that tries to uh, embed codes of uh, conduct for their employees and they work harmoniously to try and work according to those codes. In the public service we, we have that, in the public, um, in the general orders it's not emphasized. I go to work and I see people coming to work at 12 o'clock and clocking out at 2 p.m. You know, that's dishonesty. There's, those are administrative things that can be dealt with. And there's a theory, what they call windows, um, the broken windows theory. Uh, they use the analogy that if one thing, uh, if, if small things are left unattended to overtime, they 
they end up into big things. And this code of conduct, if it's not emphasized administratively, it leads to the bigger things, like misconduct in office, stealing from the public press. It's because it starts back at the entry point of uh, allowing small things to go unnoticed under our very nose. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pitmo, and for, for um, really expanding on what current mechanisms we have for coordination and cooperation in PNG. I, I saw you mentioned uh, proceeds of crime, and that's also um, something that Mr. Dummer, you wanted to comment on? Um, perhaps also the successful prosecution. I think it's also important to maybe see if there's any examples that we can speak to uh, to show where actually the process did work and someone was prosecuted and maybe the proceeds of crime were recovered. Yes. Uh, thank you. We, uh, with the proceeds of crime uh, uh, prosecutions, um, I think we, we currently have about, uh, about five uh, uh, properties. Uh, the, uh, the persons accused of uh, misappropriation or whatever crime it was uh, have all been to jail. Uh, but we have uh, about uh, five uh, properties restrained, uh, which we can, uh, we can sell, we can dispose of by selling it, and uh, the money goes to the uh, consolidated revenue account with, with finance. Our, our uh, difficulty for the last uh, uh, three, four years has been uh, to get these uh, uh, assets sold, okay. Uh, we've had a lot of meetings with uh, various uh, stakeholders and uh, we have never, uh, have yet to be, uh, 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 we have not uh, successfully uh, uh, sold any of these uh, assets yet. Uh, but uh, re recently uh, there was a, a MOU signed between RPNGC and the office of the uh, sheriff. And uh, what we are trying to do is try to uh, get the sheriff to uh, sell the assets or the properties uh, in the interim while we get ourselves organized to set up the um, uh, asset recovery uh, unit. Uh, and of course, because you will need the uh, experts uh, to uh, uh, to, to do that for us, uh, I give an example. Like if we, uh, if we, uh, or we had a we had a case against um, Eramos Waltoto, who was found guilty, and uh, there's a lot of assets involved, uh, both in Australia and in PNG. Uh, uh, the assets in Australia, the Australians have uh, our counterparts in Australia have, um, have uh, uh, recovered all those assets. They've sold them, they've got the money. They, the, they still hold on to the money. Waiting for us to do our part in PNG, if we can sell the assets here, and uh, they will, they will uh, 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 send the money from us to, uh, to Papua New Guinea. Uh, so one example is the, uh, uh, the what's the, the airplane that they had? A monkey, a place for monkey, monkey place. Monkey place. Uh, we, could, we couldn't restrain it because it's, you know, we don't have the expertise. Uh, how are we going to manage uh, the, uh, the a airline company that is in operation? We are not, uh, you know, we, we have no knowledge. The police have no knowledge. So we, we, could, uh, we, we couldn't uh, restrain the, the, the aeroplanes. Okay. But uh, things that we can, uh, we can restrain, like uh, properties, like cars, boats, uh, we can restrain. And so in, in the interim, the uh, sheriff's office will do the, do the sales for us. So just last uh, couple of weeks ago, uh, we have signed the MO, MO, uh, MOU to, to put to effect the, the process. And uh, uh, I think to, if, you, if you sell those properties, I think we are looking at about uh, 10, 10, uh, 10 million kina coming to the, uh, to the finance. So, I can it. Uh, so uh, with the, uh, uh, because this, uh, uh, process of crime uh, investigations, uh, prosecutions, uh, it, has to, it, has to, it has to start with the police, okay? Uh, it starts with a, pretty, uh, a very serious crime, a, pro a predicate offense. And uh, in the process of investigation, if we identify assets, that's when the, the next process starts. That's when we come uh, work together with the public prosecutor's office. Pro public prosecutor gets the uh, um, 
uh, restrain order to restrain the, uh, the assets until the uh, case is in aid, and the person is, is, is convicted, convicted, then we go to the next process to uh, sell those assets. Uh, right now, uh, we haven't been referring so many cases to uh, public prosecutor's office. In the public prosecutor's office, they have a, a poker unit. Uh, they basically deal with, uh, with us in, uh, in terms of um, process of crime assets. Uh, uh, the unfortunate thing is that, uh, well, first, like I mentioned, because of lack of funding, we are not, doing, we are not making a lot of investigations into major, major, major fraud and corruption. Mm. We are simply doing investigations based in NCD, where it does not cost us anything. Uh, a lot of fraud investigations involves, you know, uh, traveling. Uh, offenses are committed like money laundering uh, to other countries, so we have to travel and get, uh, get the evidence. And uh, if we cannot uh, conduct investigations, complete investigations, uh, we cannot refer a case to the public prosecutor because there's no case for us to refer because we are not doing the basic invest uh, investigations as, at the initial stages. So uh, public prosecutor, I think, is also staffed of uh, not, not getting any, any uh, uh, referrals from the police because uh, we don't have the money to investigate and refer the cases. So... Uh, uh, it, it works, uh, uh, that everything starts with the fraud squad. We start the process, and it goes through, uh, ends up with public prosecutor and, and to the courts. Uh, in the past, a lot of people were uh, sent to jail, uh, were, were stolen uh, millions of kina, who bought assets. Uh, uh, they went to jail, when they came back, uh, they were happy because the assets are still there. The money is still in the bank account. So the life was uh, uh, same you know, as usual. Uh, but with this uh, uh, process of crime, I think, uh, uh, what we didn't want to see is that uh, when people go to jail, when they come back, they must walk, walk the streets. They must start from the scratch. This time, uh, gaining uh, uh, assets uh, through honest means. Okay, so when they go to jail, they go to jail and they, all the assets that they have uh, obtained to this uh, uh, corrupt means uh, has to be stripped off from them so they, they, they can walk the streets. And I think that's, that's the biggest uh, 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 deterrent message that we can pass to, uh, to everyone. Yeah. That corruption, it doesn't pay to be a corrupt. And uh, we, are not, we, are not, we are not driving that message as, as effectively as we could. And uh, like I said, I, uh, if I can have, have uh, uh, adequate funding to do it, we will do it. Okay. Th thank you, Mr. Damaro. And I'm also um, aware that we are slightly over time. Um, but I really wanted to emphasize that point. There are successes. And thank you for mentioning the role of the Office of the Public Prosecutor with the POCA unit. POCA is the Proceeds of Crime Act. So the Public Prosecutor's Office takes care of uh, the Proceeds of Crime Act. Um, this is a really positive note to end on, and I think it also ties into the question that we had at the outset for the panel. Uh, what are the challenges in prosecuting corruption? And we, we very much had that and, um, um, from Mr. Damaro and um, from you know, the, the practitioners that we have out there. But we also heard about how we can overcome these challenges through cooperation, through coordination, whether it be by uh, coordinating entities through the Department of Justice and other actors in the room, um, also the ICAC that's coming on board. But we also heard about the need for quality legal professionals uh, within the government and within these prosecutory bodies and also the need for civil society to keep on uh, campaigning and pushing for uh, the end to impunity in Papua New Guinea. Um, I note that there were also questions on Zoom around enforcement and how the ICAC and maybe agencies in the room can talk about enforcement. Uh, luckily for that questionnaire, our next session at one o'clock is about enforcement and compliance. Um, so I ask those that are on Zoom, if you haven't registered for that session and you're interested in enforcement, uh, please join us at one o'clock um, for the second panel session for today. 
Um, but that uh, brings us to an end for the first panel session, looking at ending impunity. And I'd like to uh, invite us all to give a round of applause to the panelists that are up here on stage. Uh, thank you all. Um, now we'll break for lunch and re reconvene at one o'clock for our second panel discussion that's on compliance and enforcement, the role of regulators. Um, we have on that, again, another equally distinguished and informed panel, so I invite you to join us for that session. Thank you. <laughs>